Pum, pum, pum. Pum, 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 pum. Hey, everybody. Come on in there. It's time for Coffee with Scott Adams. Today will be the... I'll tell you, it's been a, it's been a tough morning. I didn't even have my microphone on. That's better. Question. Are you seeing me in sideways orientation, or is this another uh, technical problem? I'll bet I'm sideways, aren't I? Can somebody tell me if you're seeing me sideways or right side up? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, most of this trip, as I tweeted earlier, uh, because you go to a new environment and there are all these controls and user interfaces and buttons you have to learn, I swear a half of my life is just figuring out new buttons. For example, the toilet here has this two-part button where, you know, depending on your business, you push one button versus the other. And it has this unique design, which is sometimes the button flushes the toilet. And when I say sometimes, I mean uh, one times out of three, and the other times you can jam it as much as you want and nothing happens. Now you're thinking to yourself, it's because the bowl has filled or the, the tank is filled. Nope. <laughs> has nothing to do with that or when you do it. It's just that it only works one time out of three, one time out of five. And my entire environment is filled with that. I'm using a, I'm using Periscope right now. The comments are coming streaming sideways, so I can't read them very well. I'll try, they're, but they're sideways, uh, instead of the way they normally go. Why? I don't know. I, how many times have I used Periscope? A billion times? but this time it doesn't work. Oh, here's what I could have been doing. Instead of Periscope, I could have gone to YouTube and live stream on there. Now, you probably know that I've been live streaming on, uh, on YouTube for months and months and months, every single day. So if you were to say to yourself, does that guy know how to live stream on YouTube? Does he know what button to push to make YouTube happen and live stream? Yes, he does, because he does it every single day. Except, for reasons I don't quite understand, those buttons don't exist anymore. And I honestly don't know why. <laughs> I open up YouTube, just like always, look at the app, look at it on a browser, look at it on a different browser, and that little button that I've been pushing for months to go live, live stream, it's not there. I don't know where it is. Now, you say to yourself, I'll bet you could solve that, Scott. You know, you operate in a complicated world. I'll bet you could figure out where that button is and why it's not there. It might have something to do with being in another country. I don't know. That does make some of the apps not work. But here's the thing. If that were my only interface problem, yeah, I could probably take half a day and Google it and figure it out. But I'm surrounded by these. Everything I've touched has become a technical problem today. <laughs> Everything. Every button, every, every piece of software, every device. I've got several electronic devices. So we've reached the point in civilization where a full 50% of our time in any given day can be given up to fixing your printer, reloading your software, figuring out why the car doesn't do what it used to do before. So there's your world. All right, let's talk about the news. Uh, in California, it's reported that the government of California will not tell its citizens what kind of formulas and statistics and algorithm, I guess, they use for deciding what to do about coronavirus. And the reason they're not telling the public, it's reported, is, and I quote, state health officials said they rely on a very complex set of measurements that would confuse and potentially mislead the public if they were made public. That's right. So in California, my state, I'm not allowed to see what kinds of information is used to determine my entire life. You know, what happens with the coronavirus. Isn't that a problem? Now, I understand the point that it's complicated, people wouldn't understand, they would take it wrong, it would cause some problems. But is that a problem with the people? Is that a flaw in the public? 
because to me it looks like a flaw in how they're measuring things. If you're if you're doing big public policy like this, and you haven't simplified what it is you're measuring and therefore managing to, you're doing it wrong. So as soon as somebody says, "Yes, we're managing to a complex stop," it's already wrong. You don't need to hear what even the re- the, es- the, re- the rest of the sentence is. Uh, let me say that better without butchering it. If a politician says to you, we're, we're going to make decisions based on a very complex stop. You don't make decisions about public policy based on complexity. Because if you do, the public won't understand it, they won't buy into it, it won't work. So you need to simplify it somehow, even at the risk of being less accurate. Simplicity is really, really important. So there must be some way they can simplify their decision making down to, you know, if uh, I don't know, school children or people over sixty-five have X infections or something like that. Now it would be deeply imperfect, but probably better than what they're doing now. I mean, you, you know, you could be eighty percent um, imperfect, and it might be better than the current situation, which is not telling the public why they're doing what they're doing. Plus, we're not so smart that being really complicated in our formulas is going to get us a better result. We just don't know. We don't know what works and what doesn't. So being complicated about it, that might be adding complexity to the unknown, which is really just getting you further from anything useful. So simplify, simplify. That's my advice. Um, Seattle police have uh, made a startling decision. This surprised me. I think you'll be pretty surprised, too. Uh, so the the uh, Seattle police are going to do this thing called uh, cracking down on crime. You've heard of crime. That's when do th- people do things that are against the law, such as rioting and breaking windows and businesses and vandalizing and stuff. And up until now, um, I didn't know this, but apparently they were just spectating. So the police were more of a spectating situation. But now they've decided they're going to crack down on rioters who damage businesses. And I'm thinking to myself, now, I would like to have been in the brainstorming meeting for that. Right? Wouldn't you like to have been in the brainstorming meeting? Okay, your comments are going sideways, but I can see that a lot of them have the word SIP in them. (laughs) And I think that means that you're telling me it's time for the simultaneous set. And I believe it is. If you'd like to enjoy it to its full potential, all you need is a cup or a mug or a glass, canteen chalice, no, uh, a, a thing. More things that liquids will go into without spilling. There are several of them with different names and blah, 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 the dopamine here of the day. It's the best part of the day. Join me now for the unparalleled pleasure of the simultaneous sip. Ah, are you ever frankly amazed that I can't remember the thing that I say literally every day? You shouldn't be, because it's actually completely normal, you know, within the landscape of my brain. Uh, One of the things that Christine and I love talking about is the differences between what she can do and what I can do, things her brain can do that mine can't. She can she can memorize you know, uh, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata in three acts, which has how many notes? <laughs> I don't know, a lot of notes. Uh, thousands and thousands of notes in a specific order, and she can memorize that. I can't memorize the thing I do every day. It's just a few sentences. So different brains. Anyway, uh, the China has decided to ban the Trump administration from uh, or ex-members of the Trump administration from ever entering China. To which I say to myself, is it getting a little bit too obvious that China and the Democrats are sort of, you know, hand in glove? Now you can say to yourself, but Scott, that's not, it's not, they're not working together. They just both don't like the same thing. There's nothing unusual about that. But Every time we see a situation where the Democrats and China are on the same page, there should be a little flag that goes up in your brain that says, 
huh, maybe you ought to look into that a little bit more. So, uh, honestly, I think there's an inevitability to China's control of our information and our, uh, and our government, I think. Because it goes like this. Whoever has the most money wins, just in general. Eventually, just because of the sheer size of China, if they just grow at some normal rate and the United States grows at some normal rate, China's going to be bigger. And it won't take long because they got more people, so that's all it takes. When they have immensely more money than anybody else, they can start bribing like crazy. And they can send millions of people to embed themselves in other in other governments and other countries until eventually they have full control of everything. So there are really only, I guess, three things you'd need for China to control everything. Uh, immense amount of money, check. You know, they, they have immense already, but even more coming. Um, will, are they willing to send millions of people into undercover you know, jobs around the country or around the world? Yes, we already see them doing that. And then third, they have to be willing to do it. They have to think it's a good idea and a, and a high priority and just willing to do it. And they are. So if you take those things, what's going to stop them from eventually having a, at least a financial direct or indirect control over everybody? Take me. I'm you know giant critic of China, but even I have business that goes through China indirectly, not my own personal business, but if you look at my publishers or my uh, you know, people I work with, they have China business. So pretty much everybody's got something to lose or will have something to lose if they speak out against China. That's where we're heading, where you, you won't be able to criticize China because they'll have too many controls in too many places. What would it take for China to control CNN? What would that take? I think all it would take is to open up their market and say, yeah, you can, you can have some news here, but after you've got a nice profit there and your stockholders like it, we're going to say, you know, maybe you can't stay here if you keep talking the way you're talking about that story. So China has a whole bunch of different ways to directly and indirectly apply pr financial pressure or incentives to people. So I don't really know how they could ever avoid having full control of everything just by money you know, without firing a single shot. I don't know what, ever, what would stop that. I can't think of anything. The only thing that would stop it is what Trump was doing, which was uh, looking to decouple our business. It looks like Biden's probably going to reverse that, I think. And therefore, we will have no plan compared to uh, China's long-term strategic plan, which is largely guaranteed to work in the long run. The only part you don't know is how long it takes. You don't have to wonder if it happens. It's how long it takes. I say the same thing about the integrity of our election system. And I'll say it about every other country. Any country that has an election system and enough openness that you know people can get in and mess with it if they, if they had a reason to, eventually, I would think any voting system would be compromised by the intelligence agencies of either their own country, so that the intelligence agencies could have more power, or by an outside force. And again, it's exactly the same question. It's not if it's going to happen. It's guaranteed. It's just when. Has it happened already? Or is it in our, in our future? That's the part we don't know. But it has to happen. There's no, there's no way around it in the long run. Um, of course, there could be surprises, right? So a, a straight line prediction of anything is always is always the worst prediction. So when I say it has to happen, that assumes nothing's different between now and whenever it might happen. But things change, so there could be lots of things that, that would get you off track there. All right, um, we're seeing calls for Fox News to be banned from the White House. Now, this, of course, would be the mirror story for Trump banning CNN for a while. I don't know how long that lasted. But um, the, the call for banning Fox News, you knew that was coming. 
But of course, the stories that talk about it will give examples of, of the things they say Fox News got wrong and riled people up and blah, blah, blah. What they don't talk about in the same story is how many things CNN got wrong and how many things MSNBC got wrong. Because the claim is that Fox News is a special brand of wrong news. I don't see it. I don't see it at all. Uh, the criticisms that you know they leveled sort of depend on magical thinking, which is, uh, let's say they know that Fox News is wrong about some things that you couldn't know they're wrong about. They might be wrong, but you couldn't know they're wrong. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of that because I don't want to get kicked off of uh, social media. But, um, you know, th it's amazing that, in my opinion, I think it's true. I don't want to be a mind reader, but I believe it's true based on observation. See what you think about this. That the people who are saying that Fox News should be banned from the White House and, you know, taken off the air or whatever else they're saying, I think they actually believe that CNN is giving them real news. Don't you think? I don't think that they they think that CNN is, you know, biased propaganda, but it's on their side, so that's okay. I don't think they think that. I, I think they're completely unaware that all of the news is the same. They're just um, differences on topics. But there's no such thing as one of the news that's nailing all the stories correctly. That doesn't exist in any world. But I think they think it does. And I'm going to get to that point in a little bit. Uh, we'll say more about that in a bit. All right. Um, I was also reading on CNN, which I read for entertainment, not news, well, an opinion piece in which somebody smart was on the air saying, and this is a direct quote from CNN, quote, and this is an opinion person, not a news person, uh, who they had, a, it was an opinion person that they had on, on to talk about it. And this person said, it's, it doesn't matter who it is. It's the point that matters. It's been very clear from the data that states that have implemented strong mask policies have a slower increase in the number of cases or even a decrease. But it's not mask alone, says this person. It's mask in combination with other measures, such as measures, such as distancing and improved ventilation and hand washing, etc. Now, I don't know if that's true or untrue. It's my uh, personal opinion, based not on science, that masks probably work. And when I say probably, 90%, you know, nothing's 100% these days. But I'd say, just my personal opinion, not an expert, not a doctor, and not, in, and not even looking at the studies. Just the fact that if, if a mask slows down the spread from your mouth, and that's the problem, it just makes sense. It's probably works. And social distancing, how do you get something from somebody you're not near, right? So it makes sense to me that these things work. But why have I never seen a reliable study or set of studies that say that? Doesn't that seem missing? Is it because of my news sources? Because the, the gentleman who made this claim didn't point to a source. How many, how many people believe that, there, that this is a true statement, that science has looked at the data and they're quite, quite certain, based on what they've seen, in a scientific, logical, data-driven sense, that masks work? Where is that data? Now, again, I believe they do work. I think you should wear your mask until there's you know, some, some proof that they don't work and we don't have that. But where is the evidence that they do work? Doesn't that feel sort of suspiciously missing? It's just the most obvious thing, right? If wearing masks is so important, why doesn't CNN and anybody who wants us to wear masks point us to the data and say, look, we're not making this up. You know, this is not us just trying to guess on science. We're looking at actual studies here, here are the studies. You can look at them yourself. You know, take your skeptics in, look at them, and you can see that these masks work. Now, Democrats believe these studies exist. 
I think they might. I'm not saying they don't. But why don't I know that? At this point? And I like to use myself as sort of a you know canary in the gold mine or the in the coal mine situation, which is I follow the news pretty closely compared to the average citizen. Pretty closely. I follow it on the left, I follow it on the right. Every single day I check both CNN and Fox and compare their stories. Every day, as part of what I do here. And I don't know where I would look to find the definitive um, you know, study or studies that confirm that masks are lowering infections. Now, I have seen lots of studies of laboratory tests. If you've, if you've seen a laboratory test where they say a mask doesn't have the, the density to stop the virus because the virus will pass through, do you know that those are worthless? Because you might not if you only watch news that's sort of right-leaning. Uh, you could test all day in the laboratory, but it's not really testing the real-world situation. I'm pretty sure the only way you would know if masks work, because obviously air is getting out somehow. You couldn't exhale unless the air was getting out somehow, right? Uh, anyway, my, my, my bottom line on masks is that uh, it's not just that we don't know. It's that they're not pointing us at an authoritative source. And that's got to bother you, right? If, if they want us to believe masks work and the science is unambiguous, that's what the claim is, how come they don't just point to it and say, here it is? And, and every time this subject comes up, Joe Biden says, look, I know there are a lot of doubters, but here's a link. Go look at it yourself. Ask your best data people to look at it. It's really clear. It's right here. I don't think that exists. Now, part of the problem is that I don't think you can measure it. Um, I don't think that we have the ability to know that a certain, um, let's say, city or state had better or worse performance because of masks. I don't think we can know that. I think we can only know what happened. We can't know why. Now, statistically, you could often you know, tease out a cause, but there are so many variables going on, and we don't understand the interplay of all the variables, and they're big ones. We just don't know. I mean, you, you know until recently, we didn't know that it's hard to get the virus from a surface. We didn't know until recently that the super spreaders are really the, the problem, right? If you could get rid of all the super spreaders, you'd probably get on top of this pretty quickly. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that are really, really big variables that we didn't know just recently, until recently. And I would argue there's probably a whole bunch of variables we still don't understand. So I don't believe it is scientifically, logically possible for us to know that masks have worked by observing them in the field. I don't think that's a thing. That feels like confirmation bias. That said... It's my opinion that masks work, and you should do what you can to uh, wear them. All right, uh, and I say that in terms of a risk management um, calculation. It, maybe they don't work. I mean, it's a strange world. I could be surprised. But the risk management is that, you know, there's not that much risk of wearing it. It's just a huge pain in the ass. But if it saves lives, well, maybe. All right. The other the other news was uh, it was the New York Times had an article that the uh, the blood plasma idea was saving lives. Now the idea is that you would take some blood into somebody who had already recovered and had antibodies. You pump that blood or some condensed version of it into somebody, and they would acquire the antibodies from the person who got them, and then they would be better off. Um, I was very happy to see that for five minutes. <laughs> That's how long it took somebody smart to debunk it. <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is in the New York Times, and it took five minutes to debunk it. Now, when I say debunked, I don't mean proven that it was incorrect, but I do mean proven that you shouldn't necessarily believe it. I still think it almost certainly works. If I had to guess, 
it would be hard for me to imagine it not working because you know it's a well-known process that's been used for other things. There's just no reason it shouldn't work. But as uh, one of my uh, Twitter buddies who's uh, really good with data, uh, Anatoly Lubarsky, he follows me if you, um, I think if you just Google him, you can find him. He's an excellent follow. He's a game designer, but whenever there's this uh, data kind of a claim, it takes them about five minutes to debunk it, and it doesn't matter what the claim is, and it's really actually, it's impressive to watch, and I hate it. <laughs> I hate it, love it, because uh, I often will be tweeting, uh, tweeting studies that I think are a big deal, and it's good news, and hey, this is great, and we've learned something. And then uh, Anatoly Lubarsky comes in five minutes later with the counterclaim and the other study that shows it's bullshit. And I think, ah, not again. <laughs> Got me again. So uh, I don't know if the plasma situation actually works. I do know that there's some, at least one study, as Anatoly said, that showed it didn't. So now we have a study that shows it didn't, a newer study that shows it does. But apparently the newer study that shows it does, according to Anatoly, was a small study and not well constructed. So we just don't know if it works, I would say. I don't trust any of the studies until you've had lots of confirmation of them. Um, here's one of the things that... Oh, and, and let me uh, uh, back up to uh, something I've been talking about before. I told you I was going to form a... Uh, a news review board, if you will. It's a brand new idea, and the idea is to find some independent thinkers who you could rely on to tell you what fake news is fake news. Now, uh, that should be helpful for people on the left and the right, right? It's not about just calling out CNN. It's about calling out everybody. So it doesn't matter if you're left or right. And at first I thought I would organize it, meaning actually have you know, group of people who talk to each other and they they know exactly, uh, you know, what the topic is and then they rule on it or something like that. But I'm starting to think maybe I should just create a list of trusted sources and then you can do what you want. You can go follow them and you'll get, you know, just follow them and you'll get better ideas. I'll tell you who's on the list so far uh, for different topics, all right? Uh, Andres Backhaus, Michael Schellenberger, Michael Tracy, uh, Eric Weinstein... Christopher Hill, uh, who also is great at just using the logic of anything that's technology related. And then I'm going to put Anatoly Lubarsky on there. Now, none of these people asked to be on my list, and, uh, and they may not be happy to be on the list. I don't know. I'm just saying that if you were to follow the people I mentioned, and I'll add to it as I go, you would get the point and the, the counterpoint to a lot of things which you've only seen the point to. If you've only seen a claim, you don't know anything. So these are the people that you would rely on to look for, to know where the counterclaims are and to look at the counterclaims and the claims and give you a sense what's crazy and what's not, right? Doesn't mean that these are the people who will be right every time. It does mean that they're very smart and they have independent minds and they have a background in history of being wherever the data goes. Very rare. They're very rare to find people who will follow the data and the logic and will do it in public and will do it consistently. I named a few. Well, I'll be adding people as we go. All right, so that's where that's at. I don't know that it needs to be organized. Maybe you just need to know who these you know, better minds are and you can follow them. All right, we've learned recently that the super spreaders are the big problem and that those people who are super spreaders literally have more virus in their mouth and nose. So you can find that some people just have a big dose, and when they talk or sneeze or whatever they do, or cough, they have more virus to send out, and that's worse. Here's a question I ask, and I assume this is not possible, but I just like to think of fun, optimistic things sometimes, so don't take this too seriously. If a gigantic amount of virus in your mouth means something, could you invent, is it possible, a lozenge that would turn color or change taste 
if you had the presence of a lot of coronavirus. Is that possible? Now, the first thing I say is uh, the, the cheap, fast tests are a chemical reaction in which something changes color, right? So are those deadly chemicals? Are those chemicals you would never want to put in your body? They should only be in the, in the, in the chemistry test? Or is there any way you could make a lozenge that would you suck on it for a while and then you take it out and look at it and find out if it changed colors? And you could just take one every day. Just take a lozenge every day. Now, suppose there was also a lozenge that you knew would kill coronavirus. And you said, hey, everybody, we don't know if you have coronavirus or not, but why don't you just maybe chew on some of these lozenges a few times a day? Would that make a difference? If you use the right mouthwash, would it get rid of the coronavirus in your mouth? Or do you need uh, something more specific to get rid of a virus in your mouth? And secondly, if you could get rid of your virus with mouthwash or a lozenge or, or just some physical uh, process, how long would it take for your mouth to be full of virus again? In other words, if you killed everything on the surface of your tongue on the inside of your mouth, would it be five minutes later it's full again? Or is it tomorrow? Because that's a big deal, right? If it's tomorrow, all you need is mouthwash to end the pandemic. Right? <laughs> Am I wrong about that? But I don't think it's tomorrow. It's probably closer to five minutes than it is to, to tomorrow how long it would take to produce more virus to live in your mouth. Uh, yeah, so people are, are, are joking about bleach. It does seem to me that, have you ever seen those uh, uh, teeth cleaning lights where the, you put the solution on your teeth and then they shine this blue light on you to help the chemical do its reaction? It does seem to me like you could have some kind of a UV light if it's uh, the right kind, I think it's far UV or something, or UVC, that you could just stick in your mouth, literally like a flashlight in your mouth, and just go, ah, stick it in there with a UVC light, and clean in, you know, maybe 30 seconds, clean all of the virus that's at least on a surface and in your mouth. Would it hurt you? I don't think the far UVC light would hurt you. I think other kind might. But... Here's my main point. If the biggest uh, lever that you could pull turns out to be finding and stopping the super spreaders who have a lot of it in their mouth, why don't we go after that directly and just make everybody put something in their mouth that kills it three times a day and see what happens after three weeks? So anyway, I just put that out there. I doubt, I doubt there's any scientific thing there that would work or else we'd probably know about it. All right, uh, here's another positive thing. There are now new um, super, uh, let's say, air purifiers. Prior to the pandemic, there were HEPA filters and air purifiers, but they were not quite up to the task, right? Um, you couldn't just turn on your air purifier and everything's good. You needed a leap of technology, and now apparently those leaps are, are happening. So there's a company called Active Pure, which I believe they do as one word, Active Pure. So you can Google them if you're interested. And they make this um, box that looks like, just from the picture, it looks like it, was, it would fit on a tabletop, uh, you know, a portable thing you just plug in. And apparently it's really, really good in terms of removing the virus from the air and, uh, and killing it. And it's so good then it might be the difference between opening a restaurant and not. That's actually how good it is. Now, these are claims. You know, you have to be careful about who claims what. But what if a restaurant uh, was willing to get one of those, or more than one, depending on how many zones they have? I don't know what they cost, but, you know, people are going to be willing to pay some money to get back in business. What, what about a rule that says if you have one of these per whatever square feet they handle, because they, they only handle a certain amount of square feet, what if you had the right amount of these? Is that a good enough reason to reopen a restaurant? I feel as if we should, um, we should push to get an answer on this really quickly, either an up or down, 
right? And I'll make a direct call to the Biden administration and say, uh, dear Biden administration, if you have somebody who could do a quick look at this device and look at the science, look at the data they have, and just give us an up or down, I think the public would like to know that. We'd like to know if we can get back to our indoor spaces, especially restaurants and recreational things. That entire industry has been devastated, and we would like to get that back on, on track. So Biden administration, up or down? Are these things, do they make enough difference to, to maybe recommend and maybe fund? Maybe Biden would say, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's give you some financial aid to get some of these into uh, uh, probably senior citizen homes and restaurants and anywhere that we need them. <clears throat> now, all of this depends on the fact that this technology works. I'm not the one who can guarantee that. I, I'll just tell you there are claims and there have been at least some research and studies. All right, uh, you've probably seen the video if you're on social media uh, in uh, Tacoma that there was a police car that was set upon by a mob and the mob was jostling the police car and they surrounded it. And the police car decided that it would have none of that and just uh, drove forward and uh, it looked like they ran over completely one of the protesters. So at least one person got hurt and I thought it looked like I saw the tires go over a person, like all four tires. I thought I saw that, but it was hard to tell in the video. That might have been an inanimate object of some type that, it, that they were going over, but it looked like a person. Um, and this is what I'd have to say about this. Do we all agree we don't want violence? If you can avoid violence, nobody promotes it, nobody celebrates it. We're all adults here. We know that violence has no place except in defense. Can we be adult enough to say that in self-defense, uh, nationals for defense as well, that violence unfortunately is a necessary tool in some cases and there's just no way around it? This is one of those cases. I would like to see a lot more, po I, I hope I can say this on social media without being banned, but I think the best thing that could happen to Tacoma is a whole whole bunch more police cars running over a whole bunch more people who surround police cars. On top of that, I think citizens should be doing a lot more of it too. But unfortunately, they're going to go to jail if they, you know, if the if the uh, judgment is that they they could have done something else. But I feel as though this this uh, trend of cars being surrounded and attacked needs a solution. And I don't see the government being involved. Do you? Have you seen any government action that would make any difference to this? I haven't. So the only thing I can imagine that would stop the trend is that every time you see one of these stories, it goes like the Tacoma story. A car was surrounded, and then the car ran over the people in front. How many times do you need to hear that story before it stops happening? So now we've heard it once, and maybe it's happened a few times in the past. It needs to be every time. And, and those people need not to be punished. In fact, here's what I'd like. I'd love to see our government say that we don't plan to prosecute anybody who gets out of a situation that way. If your car is surrounded, you have the right of self-defense. Let me put this out there. Uh, sooner or later, there will be a, you know, there's, somebody's gonna be prosecuted for this, right? There's gonna be a trial in which somebody's car was surrounded and they got out of it by running over somebody and injuring them or killing them. I want to say this in public as part of their defense so they can actually use this video later. To me, as a reasonable human, this is my opinion, not my legal opinion. Right? I'm not a lawyer. In my opinion, as a reasonable person, this is self-defense and it's unambiguous self-defense. And the reason I say this in public is that I'm a reasonable public figure and that if you're uh, a jury and someday you're wondering to yourself, was this person being reasonable, that person can call on this video and say, look, other people are reasonable and they say the same damn thing, that in this situation, it is self-defense. Even if you're not, uh, let's, say, let's say the windows haven't been broken, 
And so arguably you could say you're not quite in an imminent threat. Would that be the, the argument? It wasn't imminent enough because your windows were still intact? Not good enough. Because the time it would take between breaking a window and dragging your body out is too short. All right, too short. That's like saying a gun is pointed at your head, but they haven't pulled the trigger yet. It's still imminent, right? You can kill the person who has a gun at your head. That's fair. And I want to add to that that the car being surrounded is identical in my reasonable citizen mind. So any jurors who are looking at this in the future, I would ask you, does it seem unreasonable to get out of that situation with force? I think you will agree with me that if you were in that situation, you'd want to get out of it before the windows were broken. So I support the police officer who did that. I would be terribly disappointed if there were any charges about that. They obviously have to look into it, but that's a police officer who served the public. That's somebody who deserves uh, a commendation, maybe quietly, but <laughs> a commendation. Um, Here's the funniest but most tragic part about the story in the news today, not that story, but the, the world, is that Democrats who voted for Biden will tell you in many cases that they were really voting against Trump. Now, what is the downside of having a strategy where you're voting against somebody, not so much for somebody? Could that ever come back and bite you in the ass? Well, one way that could go bad <laughs> is if the person you you voted for was not quite as stellar as you had imagined in your mind. And now we're going to see that start to, to play out. And you can guarantee that's going to happen. There will be buyer's remorse because, number one, people didn't really care too much what Biden was going to do. So they didn't look into it that, clear, that, that much. I, I think that's a fair general statement that people didn't care so much what Biden was going to do. They just cared he wasn't Trump. They say that directly. I'm not, not reading minds. People say that pretty directly. So now you're going to watch what he actually does. And the first week, a little rough. Um, and none of this is funny, by the way, uh, because there are real people getting hurt with this stuff. But let me give you some... We'll walk through it. And this is where... Uh, you learn the difference between an opinion and a half opinion. Now, I made up this word, a half opinion, to cover the situation where people will look at the cost of something but not the benefits, or they'll look at the benefits and not the costs. And Democrats do that all the time. It's almost a defining feature of the left that is not as common on the right. On the right, people will say, well, if you do this, it's going to have this cost. So let's balance that. On the, on the left, they'll say, let's do this. <laughs> let's do this, because we like, we like fresh air. Yeah, fresh air is good. Let's do this. But they haven't figured out what that's going to cost them. They're starting to learn that via a process called the news, uh, be it as it may. Uh, so here are the things going on. So, so Biden does the 60-day moratorium on new oil and natural gas leases. And New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, is saying, yay, yay Joe Biden, who we voted into office as a blue state. Yay, Joe Biden. Wait, you're doing what? You're, you're going to cripple our oil industry? And so apparently New Mexico has started to realize that if Joe Biden does exactly what he promised to do, and apparently he is, on, uh, at least on oil drilling, etc., that they will lose a ton of money in their tax base that pays for their schools and their health services. So New Mexico just realized that they had been suffering under a half opinion, and they just figured out what the other half was. You lose your school funding, you lose your state funding, you lose your jobs. But is New Mexico the only ones? No, because Biden also is going to cancel the Keystone Pipeline, which should um, cost a lot of jobs. And the unions that supported Biden are going to lose a lot of union jobs, and they're now realizing it. Why? Because it turns out that get rid of the Keystone Pipeline was a half-pinion. Now they've learned 
that if they had had an entire opinion, they would have anticipated this loss of jobs and loss of tax revenue. Now, do you think that Trump didn't understand that the Keystone Pipeline had an environmental risk? Of course he did. That was the whole point. But he also understood it had these other benefits. He weighed them, and then he made it a choice that I would call an opinion, a full opinion, with the costs and the benefits considered. Well, Democrats are getting a quick lesson on what an opinion is. And the half opinion is not serving them as well as they had hoped when they voted for Biden. Uh, so, and then, then we learned, and I don't know the details yet, that uh, more troops are moving into Syria. For what? Why are there troops moving into Syria? Now, presumably there's a, you know, somebody on the ground, an American general, or somebody said, we need these troops for some specific thing. But let me ask you this. Which is your safer situation? A president who says no to what generals ask for, even with good arguments, or a president who says yes because he trusts the experts? Which is your dangerous situation? Because Trump was the one who would say no to the generals and even basically called them idiots. Biden is the one who would say yes to the generals and would call them the experts. Which one is the dangerous one? Well, I would say that Trump also took the um, advice from the experts about how to do the rules of engagement. In that example, <clears throat> Trump taking their advice probably matched his own opinion. So I'm not sure he took their advice so much as they gave him an opinion that matched his own, and then he could say, yeah, we'd like to be a little, little tougher on those rules of engagement. But what if, here's the scenario that's scary. Your general comes in to the president and says, President, we need a bunch more troops to do this or that. That's what generals do. <clears throat> the general is never going to ask for less stuff. The general is never going to say, everything's done, let's go home. The general is a fighter, and the general might want a job in the private sector, which would be very happy to have a little more war. <clears throat> so do you want the president, who knowing the incentives of a general, the way a general is going to conduct things, which will be more, 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 just like any leader, any good manager in a company is going to go to their CEO and say, I need more. Those other departments, they don't, I don't know about them, but I need more. That's every manager in every organization. So a, gen a general is going to be one of those. They want more. They need to do more. That's how they get their, their own career does well. That's how they get that job later in private industry. So it feels like Trump had been saying no to generals. I'm guessing. This is just a guess. Pure speculation. I feel as if Trump has been saying no to generals for quite a while. As in, maybe you don't need that many people in Afghanistan because there's nothing there that we need to protect. <clears throat> it's going to go wherever it's going to go no matter what we do. Maybe it went something like that. But as soon as you see Biden immediately sending extra troops into presumably harm's way, what happens to the people who voted for him? Do they say, yeah, that's what we wanted. What we wanted was cranking up the war machine. Is that what the left wanted? I don't think so. I think they're just finding out what they voted for. And war is definitely you know, one of the things that I would expect out of a regular politician, but less so out of a Trump, who is not a regular politician. So uh, Mike Sertovich tweeted about this phenomenon, about the, uh, uh, the Democrats learning about what they just bought. And he worded it in a funny way, so I'm just going to read his tweet. So Mike Sertovich tweeted, it's been less than a week and Biden's voters are outraged. It's a tree, it's a, uh, I, I think he meant testament, but it's a testament to how low information they are that any of this stuff surprises them. <laughs> and that's exactly the case. They are low information voters who just found out what they voted for. And I feel like Republicans largely knew what they voted for. They knew what Trump was, but they also knew what Biden was. So, no, so they're not so surprised. But more generally, I'm finding that it's way more fun to be a critic than a supporter. And watching this develop in slow motion, 
even though the events that are happening may be bad, and I'm not going to minimize that there could be some bad outcomes, I don't want to make light of the outcomes. But in terms of the process, it's kind of fun, and it's kind of delightful that I can just sit back and criticize Biden for things, and I don't have any responsibility for him because I didn't support him or vote for him. So being able to criticize without the without the burden of responsibility, <laughs> it's way good. It's way better than the old way. And those who were criticizing Trump for four or five years, uh, now I get why it was so much fun. Like, I, I understand how much they enjoyed it because I'm starting to enjoy it myself with Biden. All right. Um, here's just a, a thought. Uh, just going to complete a thought here. Um when we think about climate change, we tend to think in binary ways. The binary ways are we either go hard and do a Green New Deal-sized thing that's gigantic and changes civilization, and you know it's, it's a real drastic thing, or you don't do enough, which looks closer to doing nothing. So we, we kind of have this you know, do nothing and die in the long run, according to the climate change um, scientists, or we do something really aggressive and we kill our economy and there are, other, there are other problems. But probably there's some kind of middle ground. And what I mean by middle ground is something that's a, a stalling tactic, something that just puts off any potential problems. Now, I understand that many of you watching still believe that climate change is not real. I'm hoping that you will evolve out of that belief uh, at some point <laughs> for the good of the world. Now. We could be surprised, and uh, anything's possible. But uh, the, my take on it is that climate change is something you have to address. Now, uh, here's here's a stalling tactic. Should we need to stall? And this is a tactic which uh, might be good to do whether there's a climate change risk or not. So ideally, you would find strategies that it wouldn't matter if climate change is catastrophic or less than catastrophic. It's just something you'd want to do anyway, such as clean energy, you want to do that anyway. So you don't need a crisis to do it. But here's an idea. Suppose you um, get your Generation 4 nuclear power plant and you put it in the middle of the desert in northern Africa. And because it's in the middle of a desert, you don't worry if it doesn't work. You know, it's a little safer there. If you had a new design for a nuclear reactor and something went wrong, well, at least it's in the middle of a desert. But let's say you, you, it works and you're getting lots of power. You use that power to run desalinization, desalination uh, plants next to the ocean and you pump in the water and you start growing stuff. So you, you need more than water to grow things. You need a reforestation you know, plans, etc. But it can be done. And let's say you take it. You take your goal to reforest the the desert areas in Africa. Now, if you grew a lot of stuff where there used to be desert, would you not have you know more uh, carbon capture because plants capture carbon? So that part's good, right? So you'd have more plants. But there's also another benefit, which is, and I'll need a fact check on this. It's something I've read, and I believe it's true. But if if I'm off base, I'm sure somebody will tell me. My understanding is that Atlantic hurricanes form because of the temper, temperature differential between northern Africa during a certain part of the year and the ocean. And that temperature difference is what gets the wind going, which gets the hurricane started. So if you were to lower the temperature in northern Africa by vegetation, would it reduce the power of the hurricanes even if it didn't do much else about climate change. That would be a stalling tactic because the hurricanes are, you know, one uh, predicted problem that, you know, in maybe in 50 years they would be much worse than they are now. But if you started now and tried to increase your vegetation and cool down the northern Africa, could you make a dent in it? You know, could you, could you do enough in time to make a difference? Well, the, the so I just put that out there as a question. Now, somebody asked me when I mentioned this the other day, what about all the salt brine that's created by desalination? And that's a problem, because you don't want a bunch of 
basically condensed salt. You don't want to throw that in the ocean. It'll, you, even though the ocean is uh, salt water, you don't want too much of it in one place. So the way they get rid of it now is they've got an expensive process where they spread it out and it goes back into the ocean, but they spread it out so it doesn't matter. Apparently, there's a new process where you can uh, fairly easily trans, uh, change the salt brine into something commercially useful. And oddly enough, some of those commercial uses are making desalination plants more efficient. <laughs> so you can actually use, take the salt brine, brine turn it into uh, sodium hydroxide, and uh, it's a caustic soda, blah, blah, and it can be used to pre-treat seawater going into the desalination plant, and pre-treating it uh, helps the process not gum up the works. So apparently they can make money on this salt brine, and what they don't use themselves they can sell because it has some commercial value. And one of the big problems with desalination plants is that they go offline, and this will help them not go offline. So I'm just going to put that out there. I have no idea if this is just dumb ideas or not, but there probably are some uh, some stalling tactics that would be good no matter what, right? Wouldn't you like to have fewer hurricanes? Sure. Wouldn't you like to be able to reforest a desert, make it more useful? Sure. So maybe reasons to do it anyway. Um, yeah, it's salt brine, not salt brian. Somebody says, give it to Elon Musk. Well, I think first you need the the nuclear power because the, the desalination, is it desalinization plants? Yeah, desalinization plants or desalination. Which word is right? You know what I'm talking about. All right, that is... Uh, all for now. Let me show you what it looks like outside. It's looking good out there. I think I'll go out and try to enjoy this day. A few more days here and then back to life. All right. Um, am I, are we still in the golden age? I think we are. We just don't know it. I think we're going to realize it. The pandemic uh, threw us a loop, but... Uh, We'll get on top of the pandemic, and I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna learn so much from the pandemic that it's gonna, gonna look like a better world when we're on the other side. Let me give you just a small example. Restaurants and hotels now, instead of giving you a physical menu that's often out of date, will give you a barcode so that your menu appears on your phone. I love that. And oh, and here's a feature at this hotel. So I'm at the uh, Four Seasons at Bora Bora. And uh, a feature that the Four Seasons has is that you just use an app to text them for anything you need. So anything from room service to you know, uh, making, uh, let's say, scheduling appointments for things during your, your stay. You can just send one text, always to the same person, so you don't even have to worry what department you're sending it to. And so I sit over here and I just say, uh, can you give me some coffee and some bagels or whatever for breakfast? And a text comes back immediately, uh, 30 minutes. And then it shows up. And I think to myself, every way that this was done before needs to be eliminated. The only way I want to deal with my hotel is by text. <laughs> it's great. And maybe this is how this becomes permanent. And the only way I want to see my menu is on my phone. That's great. And I wouldn't mind having air purifiers in my restaurant anyway, right? I don't care if it's the, the normal seasonal flu or somebody's got uh, you know, rabies. I guess that's a bad example. Or tuberculosis or something. I wouldn't mind having one of those active pure air purifiers in every restaurant, no matter whether there's a pandemic or not. So there are a whole bunch of things that are going to be better because of what we learned from the pandemic. So, yeah, I think the golden age is still on track, but delayed. And that's all for now. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. If I can turn this off. <laughs>